This is the fascinating story behind the Hetfield signature we almost got from Gibson, but it didn't work out and we had to make it ourselves. It is the story of the Iron Cross. <laughs> Some call it the Fuel Les Paul, others call it Uncle Milty, I simply call it my favorite guitar. Well guys, I did the ESP Iron Cross review, I did the LTD vs ESP, and now it's time for the Big Daddy, or should I say Uncle Milty. This is a tribute to one of James Hetfield's most fascinating signature guitars. Essentially, this is a Norlin era 76 Gibson Les Paul Custom that has been heavily modified by my friend Antonio Guitars to closely resemble the Iron Cross that James Hetfield from Metallica made himself. I'll get to the story in a minute, a quick overview first. The Norlin era customs feature a sandwich mahogany body, two-piece plain maple top and what's different than most, three-piece maple neck with a volute. Of course, it features a real gorgeous ebony fingerboard with mother of pearl inlays. The diamond on the headstock, the original hardware, the modifications by Antonio Guitars featured the bolted on iron cross that was handmade, the stripe that was painted on the top, distressing from the forearm, pick attack and the kill switch. Yes, this is a kill switch, here is the three-way selector and for this guitar I went with the 490R, 498T Gibson custom pickups a belt buckle rush on the back and UM73 which James lovingly calls Uncle Milty. The thing about this one, it's mostly stock, that's why I chose a 76 over 73. Because the only thing done to this guitar is the nitrocellulose refinish. The paint is original and you can tell by looking at the beauty shots in a minute. Proper replication of a naturally aged paint is a hard thing to do. This one has been played with a lot of love and it aged perfectly. It looks amazing in person and it's easily my favorite. I've said this one as in the previous videos using the Ernie Ball Master Course Papa Head Signature 11 to 50 strings in E flat standard as with the ESP Iron Cross and the LTD. There are two ways of looking at this guitar, first as a James Hetfield signature and second as a Norlin era Gibson Les Paul Custom. I'm not gonna take any of those points of view too seriously because first of all this is not an absolute exact replica of James Hetfield's Iron Cross and second of all this is too modified to be taken as a good example for a Norlin era Gibson Les Paul custom. I'm gonna use it to tell you the fascinating story of the Iron Cross and why so many people want one. Here we go. The story begins in the early 2000s when most of us saw the Iron Cross for the first time at the Auckland Riders gig. The Black Les Paul Custom had only the gold iron cross stuck to it at that time, no yellow stripes yet. The story goes like this, James took a decorative cross from one of his custom bikes and stuck it on the top of a 1973 Gibson Les Paul Custom. He also installed a kill switch and Spurzel locking tuners on it as well. The Metallica fans gave it a cool nickname, the Fuel Les Paul, because that was the first song played on it and it was used mainly for that after. A legend was born. The Iron Cross evolved in the next couple of years until 2006 when we had another good look at it in its full glory, with a heavily distressed top from James's forearm, pick attacks above the 6th string and near the kill switch being stabbed by the pick. James once again performed Fuel with it live in Berlin. Just look at the heavily aged pickups. This is one of my favorite Metallica shows ever and in my humble opinion James in his absolute prime. The Iron Cross was getting a lot of attention, everybody wanted one. Naturally, Gibson decided to approach James about making a signature guitar and working together. The information is not much, but seems solid. I managed to dig up some old info and found some new as well, with the help of the guys from the Facebook group Guitars of James Hetfield. Luckily, I had some serious help filling in the gaps in that information from somebody who actually worked for Gibson at that time. I want you to meet Alex Becker. 
Around this time he was doing artist relations for Gibson in Europe. Alex has met everyone, and I mean everyone. Lemmy, Ozzy, Zach Wild, Johnny Depp, Matt Hafey, Bill Kelleher, Brent Hintz, the list goes on and on. Check out his mind-blowing Instagram profile. What a life, you bet he has some cool stories to tell, and he will, in his book. He even hinted at a cool story with James Hetfield himself. Alex, save one of them books for me, please, would you? I contacted him after seeing a thread in the ESP forum which was hinted to me by Messe Sean again, thanks man. By the way, Messe has all the iron crosses, a Gibson, the black and white ESP, so he's a fan. The thread was about an actual Gibson iron cross prototype made in the Gibson custom shop in Nashville, Tennessee. Here are some photos of Alex holding the guitar. I will discuss this in a minute, let's get back to the story for now. According to Alex, the Gibson Artist Relations branch in USA tried to take care of James Hetfield by approaching him with an offer to make a signature guitar, and not just any, but a black iron cross. This happened around 2006. Later on in mid-September of 2008, Alex went to the States for an annual employee meeting in the Gibson Custom Shop, Nashville, Tennessee. Alex was kind enough to provide even more photos of the iron cross prototype he took when he was at that meeting. Let's bring them on screen now. I spy with my little eye a lightly aged Les Paul custom black with a cross and stripes kill switch and spurzel tuners, a Gibson tag hanging from the tuners. I want you to remember that Gibson tag, also take notice of the high E string spurzel tuner and the rust on it. They are gonna be important later in the story. At some point between 2006 and 2008 the prototype reached James and can be seen in the making of Death Magnetic. Notice the Gibson tag still hanging from the tuners, it is the prototype from Alex's photos. Take another look at the footage that I used for the intro. The easiest way to distinguish between the prototype and James's guitar, there's no distressing on the prototype. Doesn't even have the three-way switch cap mounted on it. And that Gibson tag. This is a typical procedure during which the manufacturer sends a prototype to the artist for approval. James used his original iron cross in the recording of Death Magnetic extensively. You can clearly see that it's heavily distressed and it's his guitar and not the prototype. I love this part. <laughs> some ice, man. There's that one part in the middle that takes off even The more. riff with the vocal. Da, yeah. da, 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 da. It feels great, but it's... I'm like... I never... I noticed that it's picked up before, but I never noticed it while someone was having to play. <laughs> <laughs> and staring at them. Man, that's cooking. But just the... Mm. It's that. Yeah. Make the, making those audible, you know. I also love the fact that he has a lot of fret bus on the Iron Cross. Makes me feel a little better about my crappy setup. The original was used in the recording, the prototype in his hands. It seemed that things were looking up for the Iron Cross signature. Until it all went downhill. I can imagine that the negotiations between artists, the labels and the management of guitar making companies are not a straightforward easy process. As we know there are two sides to every story and we have one of them given by the man himself. Roughly 8 years ago we had our answer. Back then James was actively using Instagram and responded on a thread about the Iron Cross with this. Who wouldn't want a Gibson signature model? But an icon turned a dinosaur. I tried working with Gibson on the Iron Cross for 2 years. Their artist relations suck. I sacked the relationship. Way out of touch. ESP listens to the artist. After Gibson's Iron Cross fell, they tried to sweet talk Kirk and he bit the hook. End of quote. And that's the bitter end of the story. Apparently Gibson's management at that time was not treating some of the artists properly. That has changed under the new management after 2019 and we see that sweet talking Kirk apparently worked. He has the greeny signature in the works now. We can only hope that James will be approached again, this time properly. Oh man, just imagine the possibilities. What about a cool 84 Gibson Explorer reissue with some nice graphics from James? Or a distressed V? One can always hope, right? They got Dave Mustaine on board, why not approach James Hetfield again? Fortunately, there is a kind of a good ending to that story. A year later in 2009, Alex met James at their Leipzig gig with Machine Head and gave him a Corina Flying V as a sort of a sorry gift. How nice of him. You know the rest of the story. ESP swooped in for the kill and in 2009 introduced the Black Iron Cross distressed replica of the Gibson. 
you can see that story in my ESP Iron Cross review. The Black Iron Cross ESP was limited to 100 guitars worldwide though and it had a hefty price tag. The affordable white Iron Cross LTD was still 6 years away in the future. That didn't stop people from wanting an Iron Cross. The obvious solution was to make one yourself, exactly as James did. People made their replicas from Epiphones, from Edwards, Orvilles, Grecos and with a bit of a luck from an actual Gibson Les Paul Custom. James's personal guitar is a 1973 Gibson Les Paul Custom, but it doesn't have to be that expensive, it just needs to be aged properly. One of the best at creating Iron Cross replicas is Augustin from Antonio Guitars. Augustin has this cool website with some interesting Hetfield custom made guitars like the Eat Fuck, like the Mento Wolf and he recently did the Vultures which is an amazing guitar he did himself, just check out the 12th fret, it's mind-blowingly beautiful, look at it. He also has a shop section in his website with some Gibson stuff like the Explorer 84 another issue, like the Les Paul Iron Cross 1973 modified one, the 82 Iron Cross and an Electra Flying V. If you want to be absolutely correct with the year, he has a 73 Iron Cross that also has the brass nut and the Spurzel locking tuners as you can see in the picture. It also features the EMG James Hetfield set. But judging by those pictures, this one has been repainted. If you watch my videos, you already know that I'm a huge fan of the Les Paul Custom. Naturally, I wanted this thing as close to stock as possible. This meant keeping the original hardware, keeping the Gibson pickups. Augustine managed to replicate the Iron Cross almost entirely by looking at photos and videos of James. Gibson had a much easier job, they didn't have to replicate the distressing. They just had to get the Iron Cross and the stripes right, install the spurzels and the kill switch and slightly age it. Because if you don't do the distressing properly, it looks kind of weird and off. That's why I went with the 76 that had most of the distressing done naturally. Augustine did a lot of things, like the handmade iron cross, the stripe, some of the distressing, he changed the frets, all of it listed here in the certificate. Initially he had the EMG James Hetfield set put in this guitar, but I preferred the Gibson pickups so I had him install those before sending it to me back in 2017. Knowing all this makes me wonder a couple of things about a possible Gibson production. I imagine that if the iron cross Gibson was done today, it would have been something like the Adam Jones run. Something like a limited run of heavily distressed aged and signed 100 guitars and 100 normal VOSs like the prototype. But wait, there's more! What happened to the Gibson prototype? Did James return it to Gibson? There was another mysterious photo in that ESP forum thread. It showed an iron cross in what it seemed to be a Gibson Les Paul custom case used in the period between 2000 and 2010. Could this be the Gibson prototype? And who is Matt? Turns out that he's not just anybody, he owns a guitar shop in France. He has some amazing guitars listed on that website, check it out. He's also a content creator in YouTube, a lot of celebrities there, check it out. And this is his Instagram, also some amazing photos and famous people in there. Be sure to check out his shop, he has some crazy good guitars listed there, like this Gibson Les Paul Gold Top X Slash, an L6 prototype and this mind-blowing Gibson Les Paul Custom Black Beauty 1957. Long story short, Matt knows his way around guitars. I contacted him regarding the Iron Cross prototype and he was kind enough to provide more follows. Remember the extremely rusty high E string Spurzel locking tuner? Here it is again. Thanks to those follows we see so much more now. Check out the aged binding and nut, the screws on the Les Paul custom bell, the nitro finish is slightly brushed. Look at the distressing on the pickups, also something I noticed in James Hetfield's video the yellow stripe has some sort of distressing on it or delamination as well. Matt bought the guitar from Gibson along with two Kirk Hammett V prototypes. He told me that the Iron Cross sounded extraordinary, had extremely comfortable slim neck and it was quite heavy in weight. He later sold it to a private collector in Europe. This gives me some hope of finding it one day and documenting it for the channel. Imagine how cool that would be. Thank you Matt for this wonderful information. You had been extremely helpful and I'm 100% sure this is not gonna be the last time we communicate. Now it's time for the review of the Iron Cross that I have on my hands. Since this is a heavily modified guitar, I'm not gonna comment too much on what is stock and what isn't. Let's just assume all of the hardware and electronics have been replaced and have a cool video about a modified guitar. Again, don't take this as a good example of a 76 Norlin era Gibson. Let's go through those specs once again. 
First, we have a sandwich mahogany body typical for the northern era Gibsons, a clearly visible two-piece plain maple top and a three-piece maple neck. Then we got a gorgeous ebony fingerboard, my favorite of course, 22 extra jumbo jescar frets that had been replaced, beautiful mother of pearl block inlays and what seems to be a replaced nut. I think Augustine left the nitro finish on the headstock intact because check out the diamond, the nitro aged gorgeously on top of it. Those seem to be the original tuners and they are one of the best that I have ever tried. Then we got a Gibson logo. Mother of Pearl without the dotted eye, which is typical for some 70s Gibsons. For the pickups we have the 490R, 490AT modern PAFs which were not around in the 70s but I requested them anyway. Looking at the patina of the Nashville style bridge makes me think that it might be original though. The tailpiece as well. The controls are as follows, bridge volume, neck volume, master tone and a kill switch. The three-way pickup selector is in the typical position for Les Paul up here. The modifications include the stripe, the distressing on the top, the pick attack distressing, the kill switch distressing and of course the aluminum handmade hand painted iron cross. At least those are the most noticeable major modifications. Pickups out of the way, let's see what's underneath. Opening the pickup cavities on a northern era gives a feels like cutting a cake. It's truly fascinating to be able to see all the layers. First we have the maple top that you can clearly see the line connecting to the mahogany body. Let me rotate the camera so you can see the continuation of the line. Then we have the mahogany body, which I already mentioned has a two-piece sandwich construction. Here is the first piece and the second one starts from around the middle, you can see on the outside. They made the routing for the pickups on the lowest piece of mahogany, then they glue the upper piece and then the maple top. This routing seems original and it's supposed to be for the legs of the pickup. If you have a mint Norlin era Gibson, let me know if this paint was originally removed. Looking at it from this angle, it reveals a short neck tenon. The bridge cavity shows more of the same with a better look of the maple top connecting to the mahogany body. And the routing for the pickups and the three-way switch, some more routing for the legs of the pickup. And you can clearly see the sandwich body seam line. It's there on the bottom, let me show you. Here, let me stick my fat finger in there. Down here, you saw it? Some pretty cool stuff to be able to see. And the plain maple top. You don't need a fancy flame top when you have solid paint on it. Here's a better look of the pickup routing and the seam lines near the sunlight. I think it's absolutely safe to assume that those are not the original 70s pickups because the 490R, 490AT were not around in this period. Initially Antonio equipped this iron cross with the headset but I wanted the Gibson pickups in it. Basically he put in here whatever he had available from another guitar and if I have to date those, those have the Gibson USA logo on the bottom which indicates they are from the late 90s and up. If you have seen my 1992 Gibson Les Paul custom wine red review, it had the Gibson pickups but it didn't have the Gibson USA logo on the bottom. This started appearing in the late 90s. Same with the bridge pickup, Gibson USA logo on the bottom, late 90s and up. I would assume those were a set and they are not as heavily aged as the rest of the hardware. The 498T at the bridge is slightly hotter than I expected at 15.25. Switching over to the 490R at the bridge, 7.55 as usual and middle position, kind of surprising, I was expecting 4 or 5 or something but it's because of the hotter bridge. And the kill switch delivers exactly what a depressed monster drinking teenager wants, a certain death. These are definitely not the original top hats from the 70s, the one that I got the guitar with got broken during delivery so I replaced them. One of the replacements is even cracked but I don't mind it. What I do like is the thumb bleeders that are always useful on Gibson guitars. Unless your thumbs are already bleeding. To pneumatic bridge and tailpiece and this might be the original one judging from the patina and the looks of it. Original gold color Nashville style with an open bottom. This one was clearly collapsed, I'm gonna demonstrate in a minute putting an extra level surface. This happens when you bolt down the tailpiece all the way to the body and the strings are pressing against the back wall of the bridge. I'm not entirely sure if this is the original tailpiece, it's not as much distressed as the bridge. The struts at least are the original ones. The backside reveals that it has been top wrapped at some point. This is what I mean when I tell you that a bridge is collapsed. 
Do you see how it bends down towards the middle? That's not good because it creates fret bus. The bridge is supposed to be following the curvature of the fretboard which is upward, but it's bent downward so it creates fret bus on the middle strings. But I like the original patina on it and the fret bus doesn't bother me that much. Let's discuss the modifications. The yellow iron cross stripe is satin and it's painted above the nitro finish. Augustine is using the exact same yellow paint he used for the cross and I'm assuming that James did the same. The distressing on the plain top, there's no nitro finish on it, it's just plain maple. This distressing from the pick attacks though has some nitro on it and I'm not sure I'm a fan of that. The same situation here near the kill switch, some nitro finish on it. Of course the party piece that is given the name of this guitar, the iron cross which is actually made by aluminum, by hand, Augustine makes them. Unlike the black iron crosses on the ESPs, this one hasn't been painted on the bottom so you can see the aluminum. A lot of people are having a hard time trying to replicate the iron cross, they do it too thick or too thin and it gives a completely off look to the guitar. Here's something I didn't expect though, Augustine is using metal inserts for the iron cross, same as the bridge and tail piece, same as the ESP iron cross. The cross is not screwed, it's bolted to the body via metal inserts. That's truly professional but I somehow doubt that James did it this way. I already mentioned that this is an ordinary Gibson Les Paul Custom, it features a two-piece sandwich mahogany body and the neck is made out of three pieces maple with a set neck construction and a short neck tenon. It has the original ebony fingerboard and 22 extra jumbo frets, this one has been refretted with Jeskar frets. Mother of pearl block inlays, all Les Paul Customs feature neck binding and usually they have fret edge binding but as I said this guitar was refretted and the edges were lost during refretting. They were chipped at some points. In any case I would get mad at such a botched job but with this particular guitar it is a beater and it looks even more authentic like this. The nut is not original which is absolutely normal, those are the first to go, you see the binding doesn't match with it. I just love the way the binding edges on nitro guitars. The nut is 42.6 mm wide or 1.67 inch. The 12th fret is at 51.8 mm or 2.03 inches. The neck thickness of the first fret is 20.3 mm or 0.79 inch. The thickness of the 12th fret is 25 mm or 0.98 inch. The fingerboard radius is usual for a Les Paul Custom 305 mm or 12 inches. This 1976 Gibson Les Paul Custom features one of the most comfortable necks I have tried and a lot of people confirmed it after trying it in the shop here. It looks like a thin C60 style of neck profile. The 12th fret measured a bit thicker earlier on because this is where the neck heel starts. This 3 piece maple neck is simply amazing and I'm also loving the volute near the headstock. The back of this iron cross is a truly wonderful place, let's start with the three-way switch cavity and this one is absolutely huge and wide compared to the LTD one that I've reviewed a couple of weeks ago. So much room for activities which is always good for soldering and you can kind of see the separation of the mahogany body and you can clearly see the mahogany wood grain and color here. Before we continue with the electronics, let's discuss the aging on the back and especially the belt buckle rash that you see over here. A lot of people seem to get this one wrong when they try to do it themselves. This one was done naturally. The only thing I don't like, there is a thin coat of nitro that Augustine applied. Directly above it, we have the UM73 marking. James Hetfield presumably already had this on his guitar when he bought it. He didn't do it, but he named it Uncle Muti because of it. If you look at some pictures of James's actual guitar, you'll see that this one is perfectly replicated. Then we got the electronics compartment and nothing here is stock. We have a Gibson pot, we have a CTS500 pot, another CTS500 pot and a three-way kill switch that has been replaced. In between them you see the mounting strip that holds the motherboard of the EMG James Hetfield pickup set. I've already showed you that this had the headset in it at some point so I'm gonna leave it here if I decide to swap. Here's another look of the seam line between the two pieces mahogany that make the body. We can also see the maple top near the long shaft pots. Do you see the difference in color? This is the mahogany, mahogany, the lighter wood is maple. And here we have the routing for the output jack. Mine has a replaced rectangular output jack cover and a chrome washer. 
These are aftermarket shutter strap buttons which had been rounded off from extensive use with a strap. This old 76 beater made me fall in love with aged guitars, I mean naturally aged guitars. Just look at the binding, the way that has aged. Look at the, all the dings and scratches on the body. It, it has so, I just love it. Next up we have one of the most important features. This is typical for the customs between 74 and the beginning of the 80s. It was a transitional period for Gibson known as the Norlin era under new management, which started in the early 70s. From 74 onwards the Les Paul custom featured a 3-piece maple neck. Do you see the seam lines connecting the 3 pieces of maple? It is harder wood than mahogany and they featured a volute near the headstock which I really enjoy. It also reinforces the headstock a bit. I love the fact that this neck has been naturally aged from playing. You can see the preferred boxes of the player that owned this guitar. Or probably a couple of owners, I imagine I'm not the second one. The back of the headstock features what seem to be the original 76 Gibson tuners and look at the patina on them, I love them. Those are my favorite tuners by the way, they work perfectly. And I removed one of them, check out those small holes. Now look at the tuner, you see those grooves here? They're to hold it in place so when you place it on the headstock, even if you don't screw it down, it doesn't rotate. These work amazingly and I even prefer them over the Spurzel locking tuners which were my favorite until I saw those. The serial number was another weird thing during this time period. Mine reads 00115969 which is pretty cool. It was transitional serial number, the 75 year models had 99 in the beginning, the 76 models had 00. The 76 model started with 06, all of them featured Les Paul custom on the top and made in USA and you can clearly see the separation of the 3 piece maple neck here. I know that this sounds a bit confusing so here is the same information written down on the bottom of the screen. Just your typical plastic covers for the electronic compartments, this one has some shielding and uh, Antonio guitar signature, the one for the 3 way switch is gloss black and looks like this. The headstock is one of the places that the guitar absolutely shines. The nut has been replaced so I'm not gonna comment too much about it, it's a decent job. Here's the maple visible in the cavity for the truss rod. Speaking of the truss rod, this is a 46 year old guitar, it's mind blowing if you think about it. So it's normal for the thread to be sticking out a little bit like this, it's not maxed out, it works well. The binding has aged gracefully as well and you can clearly see the way that the nitro finish aged here on the diamond. I've talked about this in my Gibson Les Paul custom white review, it's the nitro finish that ages, not the paint. And here is the Gibson logo from the 70s. Some of those guitars featured a dotted I after the G, this one has the I without the dot. I think Augustine cleared off some of the nitro finish on top of the logo because it looks just too clean. That's pretty much it for the headstock. We have the original Gibson Les Paul custom bell covering the truss rod. And this one also aged pretty nicely and look why you shouldn't tighten those screws too much because you end up breaking it. I've set and intonated the Gibson in E flat standard with the 1150 Papa Head Hardwired Master Cores, same strings that I used for the LTD and ESP Iron Crosses. I'm gonna link the review of the strings, now let's weigh this thing. Northern era Gibsons are notoriously heavy because of the maple necks but this one is not so heavy, just a little over 10 pounds. Now look at the 2008 Gibson Les Paul Custom White that I reviewed, it's almost a pound heavier than this. I have a question for you, do you like your guitars heavy? Do you want heavy now? Ah, I cannot do it like James, just listen to the thing. <laughs>
wow, that was quite some journey for me. I knew that the Iron Cross was cool, but I didn't expect the story to go that far. I'm not sure it's necessarily a bad thing that we didn't get a production model from Gibson, because it's so much cooler if you make it yourself, just as James did, or if you're not skilled with your hands, have somebody like Antonio Guitars do it for you. I've seen some amazing Iron Crosses done by people worldwide and I hope I will continue seeing them because this is a guitar that will just not die in time. There is some hope left that Gibson will collaborate with James again after working with Kirk and hopefully we will see some James Hetfield Gibson signatures, Explorers, Les Pauls, whatever, they will all be very cool. I sincerely hope this is not the last we've seen from the Gibson Les Paul Custom Iron Cross prototype. If you're the owner and you see this video, please contact me. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video as much as I did making it. It has been an absolute pleasure for me. Thanks to Mesa, thanks to Alex, thanks to Matt. You guys are amazing and I greatly appreciate your help.